Uh, today I'm joined by Bruce Goodman, who is the Assistant Provincial Grandmaster of Lincolnshire. Uh, Bruce, you are hanging up your chain uh, late May 2023 and passing the baton on to Jess Highland. I want you to go back. When did you get first asked to be the Assistant Provincial Grandmaster? <laughs> It's something in your life that you don't forget, important occasions. I was sat at um, the railway station in Newark about nine o'clock. I remember it because I, I'm in a chapter in London and I was waiting for the train and the mobile went off and it was the RPGM now, David Wheeler. And uh, I was asked then and it... <laughs> took me by completely by surprise. I wasn't expecting it, and uh, it uh, that's when I first got to know. And I had no inkling at all before that or any. Did you have any provincial role before then? I did. I was I was the then current charity steward for the province. So basically, the job that Pete Tong does at the moment. That's correct. Yes. Um, did you have to have some time to say to think about it? He said that. But I, I, I did make a quick decision on it okay. <laughs> so, because I thought that you're not going to be asked again for something and uh, a role like that for the province. And I thought I had to answer it fairly quickly to see how I was keen. Uh, so I gave him the answer fairly quickly. How much time does it take to be an assistant provincial grandmaster? In time. It's a very steep learning curve because you, I didn't expect to be ever asked, so it was not, not in my horizon to even consider being an assistant provincial grandmaster. So it was a steep learning curve. Uh, we had some meetings, obviously, in private before the uh, announcements were made who the appointments were for that year. Uh, I had to, <coughs> with charity, I was, uh, having been the Provincial charity steward. Yeah, your remit that. is yeah. a charity, almoners, and festival. If it's in the festival, or? well, the, the, that covers under the uh, under the charity side. I have also responsibilities for the uh, lodge of Resume, lodge of instructions and um, the Lincolnshire Masonic Social Committee. So some I knew about, others like I'd never been in a lodge of instruction. Uh, which I can explain if you want. Well, I mean, uh, in a, I'd like you to just uh, talk about, we'll come on to Lodge of Instructions in a second. Um, I want you to come back to the, the fact is, is that you were asked and the timings, how long it takes you. To get into the role? To do the role. To do the role, it was from a, an appointment, obviously. Um, the previous APG, PGMs had, was our provincial grandmaster now, and um, uh, John Crutchley, who is now the deputy. So it was convenient to ask questions of them beforehand and get into the role of but, what they were doing. But in terms of the day-to-day -day or evening-to-evening -evening role, do you think you could, you know, how many hours extra was it, was it on top of your old role? Yeah, could someone do it if they were employed? Oh, yes, yes, definitely. They could do that. Uh, well, uh, our deputy was employed when he took, took on the role as deputy and, and pre previously the APGM. That side of it, uh, we have very good, within the province, we have a very good support office. So there's no problem with finding things out and they guide you through. So in terms of your official capacity as... Uh, you're obviously doing stuff during the day, moving levers and doing the senior stuff that you big wigs do. Um, but in terms of additional nights over and above your normal craft and Royal Arch, and I'm assuming you must be in some other companion orders. I am, yes. yes you you must be out most number. nights. <laughs> I am, really. I mean, my situation is different. Um, my wife sadly passed away 14 years ago, so masonry for me became like an, another part of my family and I then put my heart into that side of it. 
I mean, what what do you love about Freemasonry? A whole spectrum of Freemasonry, the friendship, meeting like-minded people. It's an organization, I'm in other organizations, and this organization is completely different that I've come across. It's um, a fellowship that you, it's very hard to explain to somebody, uh, you, you obviously know what I'm talking about, but it's very hard to explain to someone not in Freemasonry what we, what enjoyment and uh, com camaraderie we get with being in this organization. Yeah, I would describe it as it's, you know, it's laugh, it, it, it's fun but not funny, as, as Dave, Dave Wiener says, our, our leader. Uh, yeah, there's, the, we have a few beers, we have a bit of a laugh, but there's a seriousness to it, there's a purpose. There's that juxtaposition of the two. It, it's character building. I didn't expect to come into an organisation because I've done other things through my uh, occupation through other voluntary organizations that I'd been involved with. I didn't expect that I would learn a lot about life, about me, about how to uh, approach various situations and get enough in front of people. I had given lectures on various things and what I'd been in, but to actually stand up in a lodge with our ritual, it is very character building. I grant you that. I grant you that. Let's move on and talk about the Lodge of Instructions. Right. Uh, I know we alluded to it earlier in the conversation. Yeah. What is the importance of the Lodge of Instructions? Lodge of Instructions, as I said, I, I, hadn't, I hadn't been a member of the Lodge of Instruction. And, and to explain that, uh, it wasn't for not wanting. My Lodge didn't have a Lodge of Instruction. And it's only, or in, Lodge of Improvement, go by different terms. Uh, it, it became about just after the unification of the Grand Lodges. Uh, the first um, Lodge of Instruction was about 1818, I, I believe, and it was formed for the uh, because two different lodges had come together, Grand Lodges, different rituals. It was to get them really on the same course and improve the um, uh, characters of Freemasons, even that time ago. And it's in the Book of Constitutions. They have got some constitutions associated with Lodge of Instructions. And they are sponsored by lodges. And they have to actually sponsor them. They come under certain rules within the uh, Book of Constitutions. They meet. They have to have minutes, register. And uh, the, their sponsor lodge is responsible. And basically, it, it, it is to instruct Freemasonries, uh, Freemasons in their work that they um, are do within Freemasonry. Help them with, um, with the history, help them with um, uh, how to be a Mason, what Masons are. With Lodges of Instruction, um, it is these days, uh, we've almost been overtaken by learning and development, Solomon which comes along, which teaches us a lot about Freemasonry. That was the main aim of a, a Lodge of Improvement, Lodge of Instruction. I can only talk from personal experience of my Lodge of Instruction, but um, what happens is the preceptor, which for those what not what, and we're not in a Lodge of Instruction, that's the Worshipful Master in, in the Lodge of Instruction, will explain, right, he knocked so many times, he did this because and then something happens, they did that, and then they did that because now all of a sudden it kicks in, as opposed to just kind of learning it by rote. You actually, ah, that's why they're doing that, and then he looks there and does that. It's wonderful. The, be the beauty of the, of the Lodge of Instruction, or Lodge of Improvement, is that the preceptor actually is like a director of ceremonies. Um, and he, I mean, if you look preceptor up, I think it means to be a teacher, uh, an instructor. So that is his aim, and you're quite right. Uh, masons are taught how, why we, we wear aprons, why we wear gloves, which as I say, these days, on Solomon and learning development, we provide plenty of booklets for the new initiates, new fellow crafts, master masons. But a lot of instruction still has its place today, I believe, because 
uh, but we've got to move forward with times and we've got to look at what we do within those ledger instructions. Unfortunately, some have developed into just another rehearsal night and um, the province take it very seriously. The, the active provincial officers for the year, they are each given, each officer is given a, a lodge of uh, instruction, lodge of improvement to, to visit representing the provincial Grand Master and they fill out a report of that meeting and how they view the, um, the workings within, the, within that lodge. So it, it is taken very seriously and uh, we, we look at them but I, th I believe that now we've got to look forward to probably how we interact with all our learning and development mm. and the other things that we do. Just before we move on to talk about almanacs, one final question is this, is some lodges meet every month, the Lodge of Instructions, and some meet weekly. Now I know each and every single lodge is, a, is a, an entity in itself, but do you have a personal opinion on the weekly versus, because you know, it's pretty, in today's age, that's quite a commitment. It is a commitment. Um, Skegness, there's two lodges at Skegness, and they almost we meet weekly, um, and it's developed, it's more like a, so a social evening as well. Um, but they find it, um, and approve that it does work, I think, with every, like all organisations, you get used to the system. Yes. I mean, would it be fair to say that the sleep, the, sorry, the, the, the Skagness Lodges that do, do meet weekly, their uh, ritual is towards the top end of the... Oh, yes, I would, I would definitely say. The, um, you were very correct in saying um, it's a chance to practice your ritual rather than as we do a rehearsal where you have to do it and there's no questions in between why we've done that, what we're doing wrong and a lodge of instruction gives you that ability to, to ask the preceptor and get a, an answer to why you do it yeah. and how to do it. I think that's a big <coughs> thing boys and girls out there in uh, Freemasonry land is ask at the, your lodge of instruction don't, you know, we had yeah. to ask and it transformed it. Yeah. Let's move on and talk about almoners. Now we have had the, uh, we have had some almoner questions asked by other people, but what what are your thoughts on that? It's been under your remit as as this right. provincial, provincial grandmaster. I I personally call the almoners the unsung heroes of Freemasonry. Um, as you know, in uh, you meet in a lodge, an armor gets up and gives a short report on. Uh, those brethren who are less fortunate, no names and no details of such uh, come out of that. But I know behind the scenes, and I don't know names, but I do know what we're doing within the province. And our provincial uh, armourer at the moment, Charles Jackson, uh, and Mike Allen, his deputy, they, uh, there's a tremendous amount of work that, that, that goes on uh, behind the scenes. And they are basically an unsung hero. A lot in the lodge don't realise how some of our armourers travel tremendous distances during their term of office, uh, helping also, and not just the Masons who are finding life difficult for whatever reason, whether it's health, whether it's with work, with their own life. Uh, it's also with widows. And I can talk from experience, being a widower, how my armourer, came round to see me and basically I could have very easily sat at home in front of the TV, couch potato, without that uh, support from not just the armourer, but we say we're all armourers within Freemasonry, but the other Masons that also rallied round and dragged me out almost oh. to get me back into Freemasonry. Because it could, could have been so easy, couldn't it? Very easily I could have just sat at home and this this is a difficulty and I think if you think back to just that terrible period of Covid how our armoners and the rest of our fellow Masons a lot of them came together supporting our own mm. and supporting the public out there so it's um, it's good to hear uh, final word on charity stewards 
Right. I, I was the charity steward. I came in uh, into uh, uh, that role in our previous festival for 2014. Not at the beginning. I was brought in uh, uh, in the first year. Uh, so we had already started our, our uh, charity um, festival. And I was on my own then. Developments, what we've come with uh, in the last few years, is that we've got more involved. The work is shared, and it, that has been an important part, continuity, sharing the work load. I, I, I did my work on my own, and despite asking um, uh, the hierarchy at the time that uh, I would, you know, would like an assistant, the same with the armoners. Nowadays, with the present setup that we have within the province, is that we we have that support. We have deputies, we have assistants, and it, I think now it's coming to um, uh, to mind of what actual work goes on and to be effective as an organisation, that charity work. Because charity isn't just collecting money. It's uh, really for those who receive it. And I think for the 300-year-old organisation that we are, um, that has always been a big part of being a Freemason, that charitable, benevolent mm -hmm. side. Bruce, on behalf of the province, firstly, thank you for the video. Secondly, thank you for your five years of uh, fantastic service as our Assistant Provincial Grandmaster. Um, I wish you well in your future. I know we, uh, the Provincial Grandmaster has a special job lined up for you, which will be revealed in all due <laughs> good time. Um, and thank you for your time today. Thank you very much, Chris. I've enjoyed it very much. Cheers.